All right, so today we are going to learn about the Neolithic Revolution and the rise of civilization. We have two daily objectives. Number one, list key innovations made in the Neolithic Revolution. Number two, explain how and where civilizations developed. So we've talked about the Big Bang, and we talked about the timeline of how the universe and then eventually Earth was formed, and then eventually humans started walking the Earth and created the first civilizations in 5,500 years ago. We talked about the Paleolithic era and how people were hunter-gatherers. Uh, key innovations were language, fire, wood, and stone tools. And then they mostly fought over food and other resources. We talked about men versus women, the things women did, the things that men did, and we ultimately decided that it probably just depended on society or the civilization, what the men and what the women were doing. Now let's talk about the Neolithic Revolution. So Neolithic means New Stone Age. So we're talking about the Neolithic Revolution, the New Stone Age. Remember, Paleolithic is Old Stone. So Old Stone, hunter-gatherers. New Stone is agriculture. So agriculture is going to be the defining characteristic of the Neolithic Revolution. Agriculture is just farming. So for the first time, human beings are growing their own food. They've domesticated some animals. Um, they're, they're growing animals for food. Agriculture is the major thing that brings us to the Neolithic Revolution. And agriculture is going to have a lot of consequences. One of the big consequences is permanent settlements. The very first cities and towns and villages are going to be built because people are staying in one place for the first time. You're a hunter-gatherer. You're not going to spend a lot of time building houses or whatever because instead you're moving around all the time. But if you're going to stay in one place to farm, it makes sense to build a permanent house. We also have the introduction of personal property. So now that we have these big giant houses that we've built next to our farm, now we've got room to store things. And it's my things versus you things. Because if you have a house and I have a house, my stuff's in my house and your house is in your house. And your stuff is in your house. We've got trade. We've got one community, one civilization, trading with another community and another civilization. And the two big things that are going to make that happen and make that grow really, really quickly is the invention of the wheel and the domestication of animals like horses that can pull wagons. We have the creation of writing. We have the creation of writing. So the first time people are going to write things down, make symbols that represents sounds or just ideas. And the big reason why writing is invented is to keep track of resources or how many pounds of wheat you have grown, um, things like that. We have, we have the introduction of complex government. We've got kings and under kings we have priests and nobles and under them we have traders and slaves and farmers and all kinds of stuff. We've got complex government forming in order to manage all of these resources. We've got the introduction of religion, we've got the introduction of the first laws, and we've got the introduction of organized warfare. This is an entirely new way of life. So the Neolithic Revolution, the New Stone Age, all about agriculture, brings about an entirely new way of life. So on this map, we see all of the places where agriculture popped up on its own. So the very first place where agriculture popped up, it showed up, the first place people invented agriculture, is Mesopotamia. This is the modern-day Middle East. Second place is going to be the Nile River. This is in North Africa and modern-day Egypt. Third place is going to be the Indus River region in India. Fourth place is going to be along the Huangho River in China. And then eventually we're going to get farming in Mesoamerica and modern-day Mexico by the Mayas and the Aztecs. We'll talk about them in Unit 3. And in the Indian region and the Incas. So the first permanent settlements are in Mesopotamia. This is a great map because it shows us where exactly people first started living. So they first started living in this pink area. Now the great thing about this pink area is it's between two rivers. And those two rivers take us to the ocean. Why is it important to be along two rivers? Because your farms need water. This, so if you're building your settlements near rivers, it's so that your farm has easy access to water so you can grow more crops. Realize that rivers are also the first road, so it's much cheaper and much easier to, sh to move things by boat than it is by wheel. So these are actually going to be the very first roads people are going to be able to trade up and down these rivers using these rivers. Uh, Mesopotamia gets a little bit bigger. Uh, by the second millennium, so we can see this light blue, and then the green area. It's actually the Assyrian Empire, but it's just a really big Mesopotamia. This area right here is called the Fertile Crescent. Why is it called the Fertile Crescent? Because it's fertile, it's easy to grow crops, and it's kind of sort of crescent-shaped, maybe, I don't know, it might be a stretch. But that's what it's called. 
Now, there are still people living here that aren't farming, that are still hunting and gathering. Not everybody just stops hunting and gathering. Everybody starts farming. That's not the way it works. Some people start farming, but most people are still hunting and gathering. That's these people, the people living out here. Those people are called nomads. That is a vocab term, nomads. So Mesopotamia is not a country like we think of a country. Um, it's a region where people live. The first, it's the first settlements. It's where people are living and growing farms, growing crops. But Mesopotamia is made up of these things called city-states. So a city-state is a city that functions the same way as a state or a country does today. So in most of the rest of the world, state means country, country means state, except in the United States where we have a country made up of states, which is really confusing. But basically, Mesopotamia is made up of city-states, so lots of little tiny countries that are really just cities. Now, the people that live in these city-states believe that priests controlled the rains. Why are the rains important? Because you need water to farm. So because priests control the rains, priests are going to be the ones that rule the, very first, the, the early city-states. Now, in times of war, people are going to elect a tough fighter to lead the city and the farmers in war. And by 3000 BCE, these wars are so common that these tough fighters have become permanent kings and lead standing armies. So these tough fighters, these new kings, begin to pass their role as king onto their eldest sons. And this is establishes what are, what are called the dynasties, the very first dynasties. A dynasty is just what you think of when you think of kings and queens. Basically, the eldest son becomes the next king, and his eldest son becomes the next queen. And if there aren't any sons, then the eldest daughter becomes the next queen. That's dynasties. It's when you have people passing down political, part, uh, political power to um, their children. That is a dynasty. Dynasty is probably the most important vocab term in Unit 1 because we are going to see that dynasties in the form of monarchies and absolute monarchies and constitutional monarchies are going to be the go-to political system for most of the world for most of human history. So this is a really cool map because it shows us a lot of the city-states in Mesopotamia. So we've got Dur and Tudub and Akshak, all kinds of crazy names. Um, but notice that they're all along the two rivers. Notice they're all pretty close to each other. All of these guys are farming. These are permanent cities. But notice that each of these little dots is a separate city-state in a separate country, but they're all Mesopotamian. They're all basically the same people. Now we're going to look at Ur. So this is Ur. Ur is actually the very first Mesopotamian city-state. Some of the things you should notice about Ur. On the outside of Ur, really green, these are the farms. These are where the people are farming. Between the farmland and the city is this thing. This is a wall. This wall is going to keep bad people out, people who are trying to kill the Mesopotamians, the people of Ur. Inside the wall, we've got lots of houses. These are where the, the common people live, the traders, the merchants, the farmers. They're all going to live here. In the middle of all these normal people houses, we have, we have what looks like a river. This is actually a moat. This is a moat with some bridges. And past these bridges, we have some giant buildings. This is where the government is. This is also where the, all the, where the head religious figures are. This is probably some sort of temple where the priests live. And then we've got the governmental buildings. So this is the first Mesopotamian city-state. This is Ur. This is what they all kind of look like. we got farms on the outside. we got a wall. This is where the people live. This is where the government lives in the middle. This is what Mesopotamian people look like. So notice they do have tan skin. I mean, they're, they're basically modern-day Middle Easterners, right? Modern-day Arabs. Um, so they have tan skin. They've got these real cool clothing on, kind of like dresses. Notice the guys aren't wearing pants. They have these really cool hats. Um, Notice they have a chair and a table. It looks a lot like chairs and tables that we would have nowadays. We've got walls. So this isn't this isn't a, a life that is all that different from our life. I mean, it is very different, but it's it's still somewhat similar. Mesopotamian art. This is actually a stone carving of one of their gods. Notice that he is part bull, uh, so male cow, part eagle, and then part human, which is kind of weird. But notice how intricate it is. You can really make out the different um, characteristics of the god. So the very first places that agriculture popped up, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and China, and India are also the very first places that the first settlements popped up, as we've already mentioned. I want you to notice here that Mesopotamia is actually trading with India. So they're actually taking boats along the rivers through the Persian Gulf into the Arabian Sea, 
and trading with the people of India. How do we know that? We found stuff that only exists here, over here, and vice versa. So we can see that Indian civilization, Harappa, um, and Mesopotamia are trading, which is kind of cool. So. We've got the first writing. This is called cuneiform. C-U-N-E-I-F-O-R-M. Cuneiform. This is a cuneiform tablet. So it's just like a, a heated up clay that they've carved letters into. Symbols that represents letters, that represents words. And this is kind of like a really, really, really loose translation of um, cuneiform letters into Phoenician letters, which is what we use. A, B, C, D, blah, blah, blah. Invented in 3500 BCE in the city of Uruk. We've got complex governments. So at the top, we've got the king. Under the king, we have the priests and the nobles. Under them, we have the traders, the artisans. So think of like a blacksmith or like a guy who makes clothes. The shopkeeper, so the guy who sells that stuff. And then scribes, people who write stuff down. Under them, we've got the farmers and the herders. Under them, we've got unskilled workers. And under them, they're not really on here, are slaves. This is a society that, a society that have slaves. They're buying and selling slaves. They are um, capturing slaves in war. No, not all of the slaves are black people. Slavery was around, has been around for a really long time. Um, and we'll talk about that more as we move on. Religion. So the people of Mesopotamia were polytheists. Poly means many, theist means God. That means they have they believe in many gods and goddesses. In fact, they have over 2,100 different gods and goddesses. Each god or goddess represents one of the city-states. So you've got lots of city-states. You've got lots of, god, lots of goddess, gods and goddesses. This is the goddess Ki. She is considered the most important god or goddess. She's female, so she's a goddess. In Mesopotamian religion, she's actually the mother of the universe. We've got these two cool dogs. We've got some owls. She's got these weird bird feet that kind of freak me out. But this is the goddess Ki. Law. We have the first codified. That means written down laws because it's the first place we have writing. And that is called the Code of Hammurabi. You probably learned about that in middle school. You should have learned it in sixth grade. Code of Hammurabi is written in 1754 BCE. It's actually got 282 different laws with scaled punishments. Um, basically, it's an eye for an eye if of the same social rank. So if you're a rich person and you kill a rich person's son, that rich person gets to kill your son. But if you're a rich person and you kill a poor person's son, you probably just have to pay a fine. Or if a poor person kills your son, you get to kill him and all his children and burn down his house. So it's not very fair, but at least it's written down. So like there are rules and we're all kind of sort of being treated the same, even if we're being treated the same, only the same if of the social, same social rank. So it's better than what they had before, but it's still not very good. And finally, we have organized war. Long story short, because we have more food, we have more people. Because we have more people, we have much bigger armies, which means a lot more people are dying in war. So last thing we're going to talk about, and that is the eight components of civilization. For a group of people, a society to be considered a civilization, they must have cities. Think about Ur. They have to have organized central government. Think about the king at the top. They have to have complex religion. Remember, they're polytheists. They have to have job specialization. Remember, we have artisans and merchants and kings and nobles and priests. We have to have social classes, who's on top, who's on bottom. We have to have writing. That's cuneiform. We have to have art and architecture, and we have to have public works. So was Mesopotamia a civilization? Yes, it was a civilization. And we're going to use these eight key components of civilization, and we're going to evaluate some of the other civilizations we learn about throughout Unit 1. Take a few minutes, answer your two daily objectives.